at this church we've heard that song about a million times. But until this evening, I never actually really, this is full disclosure, I never really understood what that song meant. I get that we're supposed to praise Him. And I get that we're supposed to bless Him. But due to the, the perversion of that word blessing by the charismatic movement, I've always misunderstood what it is to bless the Lord. You see, blessing the Lord is to call holy praise, to call God holy. And so, that blessing, see, we distort blessing when we think it's just things. Those things are a way of praising Him. When you're driving in your car, a successful car, when you're going about your business, that is blessing the Lord. When you are just going about your daily life, a, success, a successful individual, you're blessing the Lord. When you give your for what purpose card, you're blessing the Lord. And so, blessing the Lord, I, if we really get that revelation, we're going to rock this city. We're going to rock this world. We're going to rock. rock. Now, tonight, you may be seated. Tonight, I'm a little excited because I really feel like one of the things that we as a church are blessed by is a ministry that believes not in just preaching, but in teaching. A ministry that believes in empowering us. A ministry, there, I go to so many churches that, that the growing phase, the, the, the spirit life, that you get that initial salvific moment of the Holy Ghost, but then you just stay there. But one of the things about this church is that we're blessed with a ministry that pushes us. A ministry that teaches us, amen? And so tonight is one of my favorite nights of the month. It's the night that Pastor and Bishop Young and Brother Diaz, would you please make your way to the platform? Tonight is our monthly night of teaching and growing in the Word of God. And how many have been blessed by the last couple of Tuesday nights of Pastor Young teaching? So, Bishop, Bishop Young is sick tonight, so please keep him in your prayers. Yeah, but Bishop Young is not, he's doing well. Bishop Wilson is sick tonight, so please keep him in your prayers. And so tonight I will be moderating, and then Brother Drew from Dayton, Ohio will be moderating as well, so give him a hand now. So, the first question tonight falls under mission or evangelism. And this is going to be addressed specific, specifically to everyone, but first to Bishop Young, because he's one of the most knowledgeable men in the world on these topics. Uh, so Bishop Young, is multicultural, multiculturalism, cross-culture ministry necessary and biblical? I'll repeat the question because I messed it up. Is multiculturalism Cross-culturalism ministry necessary and biblical. I feel like that's a very good question, and it's a question that the church really needs to answer. And just for a quick response, I would say absolutely. It's biblical. And it's absolutely necessary. And I want to give you a biblical reason for my saying that. When God called the nation of Israel to be his people, he did not intend for them to be the only people in the world that God dealt with and drew to himself. But the scripture tells us that he chose the nation of Israel to be a nation. Everybody say nation. A nation of kings and priests unto himself. His intent was for the nation of Israel to be his medium of reaching the entire world. And I'll have to tell you, when you read the Old Testament record, you understand 
that Israel massively failed in accomplishing God's purpose. There came a time when God looked from heaven and saw that there was no man and no intercessor, and therefore his own right arm brought salvation to him, and his righteousness had sustained him. That's why Jesus Christ came into this world. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. Everybody say the whole world. For God so loved the world, that's every culture, every one, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then when Jesus spent several years in leading His disciples and them participating in His miraculous ministry, then He sent them out and he said go ye into all the world everybody say all the world all. not to just one culture not to just one race not to just one nation but go ye into all the world and the church will never fulfill its mission on this earth until we absolutely go into all of the world and then i read in the scripture where this message of truth was for whosoever will. I told a young man one time who was convinced that it was impossible for him to receive the Holy Ghost because his minister had told him the days of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost were over. And I read to him that, that scripture that spoke of whosoever will. And I said, I want you to call yourself Mr. Whosoever Will. Because you can have the Holy Ghost. God intends everyone. Everybody say everyone. Red, yellow, black, and white. People from all over the world. And then I read in the Word of God where the Scripture talks about every kindred and tongue and people and nation. That to me sounds like it is absolutely for everyone. And we will not have fulfilled our mission until we, until we do everything that we can to reach everyone for the Lord. It's my deep and I believe God-given conviction that God's church in a city or community ought to reflect the culture that is in the, in the community or the city where that church exists. In other words, what I'm saying is there should be some of every race and that community or city represented on the pews of our church. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Just one. Just one, real quick. Just wanted to add a couple of things. First of all, I want to say I'm thankful that I am here in this church. And I want you to do yourself a favor. Look around and see how many different races there are represented here. Take a quick look. A lot of different races, cultures, folks that speak different languages. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful to be in a multicultural setting. Thank God for my pastor, because if it was not for his ministry and his, as you can tell, he believes in multicultural ministry, I wouldn't be here. So, uh, thank God for that. The Bible says this, Jeremiah 32, 27. Behold, I am the God of all flesh. Luke 3, 6. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Genesis 12, we all know this is where God called Abraham, gave him a promise. In that promise, the Bible says, in thee shall, everybody say, all nations. All nations of the earth be blessed. In your commentaries, when you look up that scripture, specifically that word, it is actually translated a couple of times uh, in a way where it specifically speaks of clans and even more specifically, races. So God's intention is to bless people from all different races. At the end of the day, when we're all home in glory, the book of Revelation <coughs> gives us this picture. Revelation 7 and 9 says, After this I beheld, 
goes on to say, a great multitude. Everybody say a great multitude. It says, of all nations, peoples, tongues. It said that they stood before the throne. The gospel is for everybody. God's love for everybody. I'm just thankful that we know the word of God and that we're here in a place that believes that it's for everybody. I am in full agreement with both of them. I was having this conversation recently with our youth pastor, my son, and uh, he humorously said, he said, Dad, we better believe in multicultural ministry or we wouldn't be here. And I said, well, yeah, because it dawned on me. It didn't come to my culture first. The gospel came to the Jews. So every stinking one of us need to be grateful that this is a whosoever will gospel or none of us would be here. So it is necessary. It is biblical. Now, there is the reality because that somebody said that the most segregated place in America is Sunday morning at church time. And the reality is that in Christendom, uh, that is largely the case. Not every church is like this. Uh, and there are churches that are changing, that are expanding. Uh, much of this developed over what scholars uh, are missiologists and sociologists of Christian perspective have labeled. It was, I'm not sure who coined it. It was made popular by, by, by a guy named Peter Wagner that it was called the homogeneous principal unit, shortened by scholars as the HPU. The idea was that churches will grow better and quicker if people are grouped in their homogeneous principal unit. In other words, Filipinos are going to be more comfortable in their environment, so they're going to grow better. Hispanics are going to grow better in their environment. And so, theoretically, the idea is because of comfort and so on and so forth and uh, comfort zones that it would be more effective. And so there was a whole wave in the 70s, 80s, and 90s of the HPU that influenced what we would call the church growth movement. It happened in the denominal world. It even happened uh, in a lot of what we would state as the apostolic movement. But the reality is, even if that is true, because we all have our comfort zones, Okay? But what developed was problematic because let's take the uh, Hispanic or Latino community or even the Korean Christian movement in one of the doctoral classes I was with. There is a big struggle right now in what they call the third generation uh, of Korean Christians that have come to the United States. The first group of the first wave of immigrants that were Christian they would gather based off of their language and culture issues. So they would have Korean church and Korean language. And then the kids began to develop. They were kind of bilingual. They were Korean in language at home, but at school they were English. Well, by the time you get to generation three, the, children, the grandchildren don't even speak Korean anymore. But yet they're forced to go to mom and dad or grandma and grandpa's Korean church that they have now become Americanized or anglicized, depending on what the culture is. And this has been a big discussion. And what happens is often it becomes a, while new immigrants are coming comfortable in the environment, the grandchildren are leaving because they feel disconnected. And so this is a real problem. The other problem was that what happened when these homogeneous principal unit churches, what happened is they would switch and say, well, we don't want to just now have a, we'll, we'll pick one, a Filipino church that just speaks Tagalog. We'll have, in our community, we will have a Filipino church that speaks English. And my question is, is why would you do that? Because in heaven there's not going to be a Filipino section, and a Hispanic section, and a white section, and an African section. We're all going to be around the world. And so... God's intent, this is what we need to get. I know we're more comfortable. I, I'm real comfortable. Take me to Louisiana, drop me on the back of a swamp, eating boiled crawfish, lazy, lay bon ton roule. I'll have a lot of fun with my Cajun family. That's real comfortable for me. 
But that's not what church, church is not about you and I being comfortable. The kingdom of God is about us displaying to the world what the earth is to look like when Christ reigns. So there is a biblical principle that goes beyond my homogeneous principle unit where I'm comfortable. I am charged with the responsibility to reach over to my Hispanic brother and greet him as a brother and show you what faith looks like together. So brother Young, are you saying that that we're all the same. No, that's a joke. I'm not Mexican. He's not Cajun. I'm white. You're black. You're brown. We're not advocating a colorblind church. I hear that. That's wrong too. Don't fall into that. Because I'm not trying to lose who I am. I'm not trying to become this gray matter where there is no color. In fact, the scripture you use, Brother Diaz, is pretty important because the writer said, John the Revelator said, he said, I saw, I beheld. He said, I looked and there was a group around the throne from every kindred, tribe, and tongue. How did he know that? He saw. He recognized. Hey, there's a black guy, there's a brown guy, there's a red lady, there's a man, there's a woman. He was able to recognize that they were different. But the different cultures, people, race, and kindred had some things in common. They were all in white robes. They were all around the same throne and every single one of them was saying, glory and honor to our God. The black guy was saying our God, the white guy was saying our God, the African, the Chinese, the Hispanic, they were all saying that's our God. And so what God wants to do is take all of us, put us in the same white robes of praise and salvation and gather us around his throne and we all cry glory to the great God that rules the heavens and the earth. So in my opinion, my understanding of scripture, Pentecostal fell out on all of them and around the throne, it's from everybody. So from the beginning on the birthday of the church to us around the throne, it's for everybody. Don't go, if you're watching my internet and they don't allow everybody in their church, you need to find you a different church. All right, this question is related to holiness or standards of holiness. The question is, what does the Bible say about jewelry? This is for really young Pastor Young, sorry. Okay. What does the Bible say about jewelry? Okay. Well, it has a lot to say. And uh, some of you, this may be new. Uh, and these are questions that, that come from time to time. And uh, I want to give you a, what I would, I would believe would be Maybe just a brief synopsis of some of the things that that forms what this church stands for. And let me say that this this door, the doors of this church are open to everyone, unless they become problematic and cause a problem within the body. And uh, so the house of God is open to all people, no matter where they are in their journey of faith, no matter where they are in understanding of life, or even where they are in understanding of scripture. Uh, but what has happened in Christianity for the idea of social acceptance, there are many things that have ceased to be taught that have not been removed from the word of God. And so uh, this is one of those things that sadly, the majority of Christianity even 50 years ago, stood by these truths. But uh, let me start by this. How do we recognize a football player? The uniform. How do we recognize a peace officer or a police officer? The uniform. It is technically, according to the Geneva Convention, it is technically illegal for, uh, as according to international law, for you 
to fight for your country under the uniform of another country. Breaks the international laws of even how war is supposed to be done. So there's a lot in the human condition that has to do with apparel, attire, things that we do. And if you have your Bible, I want you to go, I'm going to take the time, I'm not just going to give a topical answer. I want you to go in your Bible with me to Genesis chapter 35. And I want you to look at some scriptures with me. Genesis 35 and 2. I wish we had the screens, but it's drama time. So this is why you need to be bringing your Bible to church in this season. The Bible says, Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all uh, that were with him, Put away the strange gods. So he's, he's recognized there's idolatry in his home. That are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. This is important. Because this is one of the first places in the Bible where what we wear is connected to the spiritual dimension. And he said, let us arise and go to Bethel and I will make there an altar of the Lord who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me on the day in which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods, now notice this, which were in their hand and are on their hand. And all their earrings which were in the ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So here was a scripture. This is one of the first places you see this in the Word of God. Jacob's family was in a severe time of distress, even possible death from the opposition. He's wanting to make sure they are well prepared and right with their God. And he says, hey, we've got to clean some stuff out of our life. We have some things that we are wearing that are idolatrous in nature. And so we see a connection between the wearing of certain things and the spiritual dimension. Uh, let's go to uh, backwards. Or no, let's go over to Exodus. Exodus 35. Or 33, I'm sorry. Go to Exodus 33. And let's look at verse number 3. Exodus 33. Unto a land flowing with milk and honey, God's telling you, I'm not going to do this for you. For I will not go, he says, but I'm not going to go up in the midst of these, talking to his people. For thou art a stiff-necked or rebellious people. He said, I, I can't come. I'm going to go judge. I'm going to take care of some things. But he said, I can't come in your midst. Because you're in a place of rebellion right now. He's talking to his people. And he says, you're in a place because if I come in my holiness, a holy God, if I come with all of my power and holiness, you're not going to be able to suffer that because I'm a holy God and I'm not going to be able to dwell with your, your rebellion and, and the attitude that you're showing. And the Bible, look at what the people did. And when the people had heard these evil tidings, they mourned. And no man did put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I will come upon thee, or in the midst of thee, in a moment, and consume thee. Now notice what God says. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. So get this picture. God is angry at their rebellion. When they hear that God's angry, they said, you can just see it happening. You better take that off. I don't know if any of you ever noticed this before. And then, as they're taking all this stuff off, as Bishop would say, as they're taking off all the bling bling, as they're unpacking all that off their body, God says to Moses again, He says, I'm going to determine how I'm going to treat your rebellion according to what you do with all of your ornamentation. It's pretty sobering scripture that's in your Bible. Now let's turn over to uh, Exodus 35. And let's look at verse 22. Exodus 35 and 22. I'll back up for a moment. Bible in verse 10 says, And every wise hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord has commanded. Because this was, uh, they were going to build the tabernacle of God. 
Okay, they were going to, this was the plan, the pattern that God had set forth, and now they're going to help build the house of God, the tabernacle of God. And look at 21. And they came, everyone whose heart stirred, everybody say heart stirred. So they, something happened inside them. Their heart was stirred up. And whom his spirit made willing. So they had a willing spirit. So something happened as they began to build the tabernacle. Their heart was stirred. They had a wise heart. They grabbed it. They understood it. And their heart and spirit was made willing. And they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation for all of his service and for the holy garments. And they came, both men and women, and many as were willing, hearted, and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets and all jewels of gold. And every man offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. So here it was. So when God was angry, they recognized we got to take this stuff off because the judgment of God is going to depend on us. When Jacob recognized we got to be right with God, they took it off. Now it's time to build the house of God and establish the house of God for the ministry of the priesthood, the ministry of the work of God. They begin to take it off because their heart was stirred within them and they recognized we need to take this stuff off and do the work of ministry. So these are patterns that we see in the word of God. Let's turn now, let's jump a little bit over. Let's go to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter three. Isaiah 3 and verse 21. Now let's back up. Uh, God is saying what he's going to do uh, in 3 and 18. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet, their calls, their round tears like the moon. These people, would they would weave gold into their hair and they would wear these golden crowns like these tiaras to, to support their, their wealth and uh, presentation of themselves. The chains, the bracelets, the mufflers, the bonnets, the ornaments of the legs, the headbands, the tablets, the earrings, the rings, and the nose jewels. And, and it goes on. And, and here is God is saying, I'm going to judge this. Okay? God is going to do this. So he's going to judge them. Now let's go over to, uh, let's go to the New Testament. Let's go to 1 Timothy. Let's if I can get there. I tried to mark these so it'd be a little quicker. 1 Timothy. Chapter 2 and verse 9. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. And in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So what these people would do, they'd put all this stuff in their hair to get their hair to to glisten and to glitter and they would pile up the stuff that was unnecessary just to just to show off they would paint they would adorn themselves and and represent themselves he goes on to say he said let the women learn in silence with all subjection but i suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man but to be in silence and there's people that take that scripture and say that is a scripture against women teaching or preaching in church but you have to understand the context it's in the context of holiness teaching and standards of righteousness on the woman. And he says, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority. But notice what he says. For Adam was formed, was first formed, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved. So what he's talking about, he uses this, is that I had given Adam a principle and a law. Don't eat of the tree. But because of the feeling in her that Lucifer had put in her mind, that I am not what I need to be. She questioned her image. The garden issue was an image in, was an image issue. And so because of that, she began to work on Adam at home. Even the Bible says Adam was not deceived. He knew full well what the rule was. But she was deceived by Satan. She was deceived by the abuser of the brethren who had placed in her mind that you need that tree so that you're all that in a bag of chips. She went on to work. And this is what Paul is saying. Is he saying, a woman should be adorned in, according to God's holy pattern. Don't you get home when I'm done preaching and teaching. Don't you get home and undermine to your husband what I preach at this church. That's what the context of that scripture is. 
But don't, don't miss it. People get focused on the women in ministry. Deal and miss the point of that is that was all about holiness. And let's go to one more. We'll come back to this in, in one of the other questions. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3 uh, and uh, verse number 1. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection, subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey the word, and they also uh, may without the word of God be won by the conversation of the wives, of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not let it not be that outward adorning, planning the hair and wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and even the ornament of a weak, a meek and quiet spirit. So when it comes to, you got to put all this together. This is why the word of God is not for private interpretation. That means you build line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. You go through the word of God. You rightly divide the word of God. So in the Old Testament beginning, which is the, the, the teacher that brings us, we learn it's for all instruction and righteousness. So when it comes to jewelry, you'll look on this platform. You'll look at the leadership of this church. We don't, we don't wear jewelry. Why? Because this is what the Bible teaches. That the ornament of a godly man or woman is the ornament of a, of a meek and quiet spirit. We're not flashing our body. We're not, we're not trying to draw attention. We're not trying to add cosmetics like the cosmos and the bling, bling of the stars. All of that is within us. Like that old tabernacle, the outside was those badger skins, the gold and the beauty and the tapestries, that was all on the inside. And so that's where that understanding of why this church takes the stands it does is, is because of those principles that we read from the scripture. Dan, if you want to add to that, I know I, I covered a lot of ground there. I really don't have anything to add. I think he's done an excellent job, and I think we ought to give him a hand for that. I just want to say I thank God for men of God that will break the bread of life and preach the word of God without fear or favor of man. Amen. Some of you will remember the name R. E. Johnson. I remember, I remember many years ago for the R. E. Johnson preaching for us in Baton Rouge. And one night he preached on the very subject we're talking about now, on standards and jewelry and that type of thing, makeup and all of that. And uh, Brother Johnson was a unique preacher. He uh, had a lot of humor in his message, but it always came to the point. And after he read his scripture, he said, my subject tonight is ugliness needs an adornment. And he talked about the beauty of holiness and the beauty of the people of God. And uh, I think uh, everybody got the understanding and the idea that you can't improve on what God has done. And I've often heard people object to the scriptures that Pastor Young just read from the Old Testament, saying that you are, you are applying an Old Testament principle to a New Testament experience. What I want to remind you of, and I don't think I need to do this, but I want to remind you, the Bible said all scripture. Everybody say all scripture. All scripture. Is given by God and is profitable for doctrine and also for reproof. So we need the entire book. And so I'm glad to find any passage of scripture and I find the will of God represented in that scripture. I'm ready to live. Amen. I would just say ditto, ditto, ditto. And especially when it comes to all of the scripture that pastor has mentioned tonight and read, you can, you can tell in the context, the attitude that God has towards adornment and jewelry. And uh, if I want to please Him, it's pretty simple. I'm going to do things that please Him, not the things that get Him mad. Our next question is for you, Pastor Diaz. Can you explain Paul's discourse about hair in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 1 through 16? Okay, so the hair, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is very, very important. And it has a lot of detail with regards to that subject. 
I'm going to have Pastor and Bishop Young add to this uh, because they can do it full well and capable. But I do want to say this about here, especially coming from a context of Spanish ministry, if you want to put it that way. Uh, I come out of a organization. When I was first converted, I was not converted here at the Rock Church. I was converted at a congregation in a place where they used a cloth veil on the woman's hair, and that was the veil. Some of you are familiar with that. And then I transferred down to San Diego, once again found another apostolic church that practiced the same thing. During that period of time, uh, I was just a new convert, didn't know nothing. I just knew I loved God and I wanted to get into His Word. And God began to reveal some things to me uh, through also not only prayer and Bible study, but also some books that somebody helped me to buy with regards to doctrine. Long story short, on the front end, is I ended up leaving that movement, if you will, and by the grace of God, the love of God. Um, God led me to pastor back down in San Diego. This is back in 1996. And one of the main reasons why I left is because the church, though it said it was apostolic and they were good people, not saying that they're bad people and I'm not casting stones at them, but they were not teaching uh, holiness. It wasn't just in this area, other areas as well. And I could not fight against what God had revealed to me through His Word. I was at that church and I literally was becoming stale spiritually. I needed help. So God provided a way and connected me with Pastor. Uh, the reason why I believe it so strongly, if you will, is because to me, it's plain and simple in the Bible. And I, I mentioned the Spanish context because of the fact that that's where I minister, that's, that's where God's called me to be. And in that context, I've had to teach from this passage in that perspective and the people that also come from that type of background. And really, it's pretty, pretty, it's very simple. When you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, one of the things that I want to highlight is verse number 15. Where the Bible says, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. Now focus on this last part. It says, for her hair is given her for a covering. Now, pretty simple English. But I want to show you something when it comes to the Spanish translation of that verse. I'll read it to you in Spanish. There are some of you that understand Spanish, but then I'm going to interpret it. Verse number 15 in Spanish says, uh, por, el, por el contrario, a la mujer dejarse crecer el cabello le es honroso. Last part says this, porque en lugar, everybody say en lugar. En lugar de velo le es dado el cabello. En lugar means instead of. So it's saying, en lugar de velo, instead of the veil, speaking of a cloth veil, it says, le es da, dado el cabello, you have given her her hair. So the Spanish translation, it is closer in that scripture to the actual Greek language, which would interpret it, for instead of a veil, you have given her her long hair. So it's pretty simple to understand that, once again, in the Spanish context from which I minister, this is the way I teach it to the members of La Roca, is the long hair of the woman is, in fact, her veil. It's not a cloth veil, it is the long hair of the woman. Now, before I pass it over to Pastor and Bishop Young, one of the things that's unique to me also is this. Long hairs on the woman serves as a covering. When you do a study from the Old Testament and you look up where the word covered, covering, where it is applied, one of the main places where it is applied is in the tabernacle. 
where in the holiest of holies you had the Ark of the Covenant, and then you had two angels that would extend, had their wings extended, touching one another, and they would cover one thing. Do you remember what it was covering? The glory, Shekinah, somebody mentioned Shekinah, the glory of God. So from even the Old Testament, covering is connected to glory. So it's easy for me to see how now the Apostle Paul is taking that and applying it to the hair of a woman. There's covering, there is glory attached, and it is the long hair of the woman. So Bishop Young, pastor, if you guys would add to that, please. Thank you, Brother Gerardo. This is a, this is a very essential and very important uh, focus for the apostolic movement. A lot of them, the so-called people of God have walked away from this principle, but there are listed in uh, the 11th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians several reasons why that uh, the lady should have long hair. And uh, one of them is because of the angels. Everybody say because of the angels. And then uh, we need to also understand that uh, the theme of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is the theme of headship. It recognizes uh, the headship in our lives. And when we choose to violate and walk away from the principles of Scripture, then the judgment of God will fall upon us. And uh, I'm happy to be a part of this church that preaches the whole truth. And uh, the men have cut hair and the ladies have uncut hair. And I would conclude my remarks by saying that long hair on the ladies is hair that has not been burnt off, trimmed off, or shortened in any fashion, but has been left to grow as God will have it to grow. As has been mentioned, this, this passage of Scripture uh, has to do with spiritual authority. And there are God's intent in creation. You don't have to look very far to see that God is very concerned about distinction when it becomes when it comes to male and female. You can look many places in the uh, animal kingdom. You can you can distinguish a uh, the male deer from the female deer. You can distinguish the male lion from the female lion. Observable. God intended that to be that way. Male and female created He them. And so one of the ways we, that we see this in Scripture is not only through attire, but God did that with the hair. Uh, he made it that way on purpose. And as Brother Diaz mentioned, the covering, covering is a big deal. And in fact, the first rebel who was Lucifer was the anointed cherub that... What? Covereth. If you didn't know that, you need to know that. So... What's he going to do? The guy that was supposed to be in charge of covering is the first guy to rebel. So whenever you look in scripture, anytime you, you change covering or you act in ministry, you can go back in the Old Testament and see where there, is, there were people that acted outside of covering or tried to act in some place that has to do with authority. When they tried to minister outside of proper covering authority, there was judgment that would come. And so this passage of scripture is in line with that same idea. And verse number five in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, every woman that prayeth and prophesied with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head, for it is even, here's an important verse, this is where it gets weird. Look at your neighbor say, this is gonna get a little weird. Okay, pay attention. For it is even as if she were shaven. So he makes this wild claim that if she's uncovered, she's dishonored. It's about authority. And it's as if she were sa shaven. So, so why are we now talking about women with shaved heads? Verse 6, he said, if she be not covered, let her be shaven. But if it be a shame, he introduces an idea, if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven. Now remember, his audience is Jewish. They understood this. Okay? He said... 
for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. What he's saying is, is you know it's a shame for a woman to be shaven. And he said, women don't need to be shaven, they need to be covered. Then he says in verse 15, but if a woman have long or uncut hair, it is a glory to her for it. Her hair, as he just said, is given to her for a covering. So where, what is this idea of shame? Well, then Bishop Young mentioned verse 10, because of the angels. Because here's, here's the reality. You got to go back to the Old Testament. There was the test of bitter water. A husband would think, may think, I think my wife has committed adultery. But he didn't have a video camera to prove it. He didn't have a tracking device to follow her donkey where it went. So what does he do? He thinks his wife's committed adultery. This is in your Bible. And he, he goes to the priest and said, I think my wife is committing adultery. And he says, all right, we're going to have a lie detector test. This is the first lie detector test. You can take a lie detector test today because your body physically will re react when you lie. Well, the first one is found in the Bible. They would bring the woman before the priesthood, before the congregation, and there in front of God and everybody, they would shave her head. That's what Paul is alluding to. That you know it's a shame, you Jewish people I'm writing to, you know it's a shame for a woman to be shaven. Because you know what that means. That means she has just been publicly shamed and humiliated that she's been accused of being an adulteress. If she was lying, she said, I haven't committed an adultery, but she had. What happened when she was saved, the priest would gather the dust from the temple floor. Brother Carpenter preached about that, about the dirty floor of the church. Mix it with water that the priest had prepared. She would drink that with that shame head. The chemical reaction to that physical reaction in her body when she lied. If she lied, that mixture would create a problem. And the Bible said that her thigh and belly would rot. Speaking of her reproductive organs, she would begin to physically deteriorate. And it was proof that she was lying and had been an adulterous woman. If she had not lied, nothing would happen. And the husband was shamed and he was rebuked. And they lived happily ever after. Imagine that. Can you imagine going home and live with that sucker after he did that to you? <laughs> it was a shameful thing to have that head shaved in front of everybody. And that is exactly what the Apostle Paul is picking up on. But what does that have to do with the angel? Well... You have to understand this is about spiritual authority. And at No Limits, I preached about the watchers a few years ago. The other night, two Sundays ago, I preached about the watchers. Remember the angel that's riding through the myrtle trees and, uh, and Zechariah talks about that angel coming to the Lord, speaking of that watcher. He said, I've been going to and fro in the earth and I've been looking at 70 years. You're supposed to be doing something, God. And we see the, that Lucifer is going to and fro in the earth. And we see that staff meeting in the heavens. And Satan comes among the sons of God. And you consider my servant Job. Have you been watching? These are the watchers. Daniel, three locations we see the watchers. Then there's this strange, weird book from the second temple period during the intertestamental 400 years of silence that is called the book of Enoch. The book of Enoch is quoted by Peter and is quoted by Jude and is alluded to even by the Apostle Paul and even Matthew and Mark. You can see Peter quotes directly, <coughs> Jude quotes directly from this book. What did the book say? It tracks right along with a weird passage in Genesis chapter 6 where the sons of God went unto the daughters of men and giants were born in the land. Jude refers to that occasion and talks about those angels which kept not their oikaterion, their habitation. But they, like Sodom and Gomorrah, went after strange flesh and are now bound in darkness. Peter tracks, if you look at, at uh, the, the Apostle Peter's letter, he writes about the same thing. It tracks right with Jude. And he talks about those angels that sin, referring back to Genesis, talks about the flood. Giants were there. We understand that that was why the flood came, because these giants were trying to pervert the seed. And we're, we're entering in and, and giving uh, uh, offspring to these daughters of men. And giants were born. God judges the earth because of, as Paul would refer to, the transgressions. We often think of transgression sacred. But it's talking about there was a corruptness that filled the whole earth that had to be judged. God had to wipe out the earth. This thing was perverted. They were trying to pervert the seed of Messiah. This, is, this was a very weird, mystical, demonic 
thing of sexual impropriety that Jude picks up on and Peter picks up on and Enoch picks up on that he writes in that 400 years before Jude wrote about it, before Peter wrote about it, they quoted from the book of Enoch. In fact, Jesus would quote, these are the books that they read from those 400 years of silence. And if you read the book of Enoch, which is not a biblical book, but it's, it's a book that was read, and it was the story of what happened, and it unpacks for you what happened. And what's weird, what's really interesting, is these giants that came down and went into the daughters of men, the, that book of Enoch says, they came and taught how to make weapons of war, how to paint the eyes and the cutting of the hair. And Paul said, you know it's a shame for a woman to have cut hair. If she's going to trim it, if she's going to cut it, if she's going to shear it, she may as well shave it. And you know it's a shame. And he said, she's got to have power on her hair because of the angels. They knew well, his audience knew well that story. They knew it well. And that's a big, big discussion in the Bible. In fact, when you understand that, you start reading Paul's writing, you start reading Peter's writing, you start reading Jude's writing, and you're like, oh, this is a whole other dimension. Why is that in there in the hair issue? Why is hair so important? Because of the watchers. It's what Enoch called them. It's what Daniel talked about. Because there are fallen angels, and then there are ministering spirits. And the devil goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Brother Young, are you saying that the angels are going to come marry and uh, enter into some kind of inappropriate relationship with me just because I trim my hair? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying now it's a spiritual perversion. The seed's already come. Jesus Christ came. He, was, he wasn't able to stop that. But now he tries to pervert the seed. That's you and I. He tries to pervert the church through false doctrine. And the devil goes about seeking whom he may devour. The watchers are looking and they spot rebellious one in the church. But they also see those that are under authority. And ministry spirits can operate, Paul said, because of the angels. A woman ought to have glory in so, so when we talk about hair, it's not just some weird rule the preacher came up with. It's a dimension that goes way, way back to antiquity that's a very spiritual reality. So that is, that's where you pastor, where that's, that's where we come from and understand what the Word of God has to say on that subject. All right, this question is for Bishop Young and it pertains to stewardship. Is tithing really, really biblical? Is tithing really biblical? Yes, it is. Some people argue against tithing because they say, Tithing was under the law. But I, I want to call your attention to the fact that tithing preceded the law. The first reference to tithing in the Word of God was in Genesis chapter 14, where Abraham paid tithing to Melchizedek. This was way before the law. The second occasion where Word of God references tithing is Genesis chapter 28, which was also prior to the law. And uh, the law included tithing in uh, the book of Deuteronomy chapter 12. So you see, tithing preceded the Old Testament law a long time before the law came into existence. And when the law passed from uh, uh, from the scene and the New Testament era of time came uh, the, the law passing did not dismiss tithing and we tithe because the word of God teaches us to do that uh, the word of God refers to tithing as the first fruits it also refers to tithing as the Lord's portion and God has given us several promises if we pay time. Now, I want, to, I want to be cautious to say we do not do anything in terms of giving to God in order to get. But that does not uh, change the fact that when you obey God and you give God what is rightfully His, God is going to bless you for that. Tithing 
It's not our money. That's God's money. That's the first fruit. That goes to God. Offerings are beside the tithing, are on top of the tithing. When you have given 10% of your increase, then your offering does not start until that tithing has been given. And uh, God will bless you for that. He will open the wonders of heaven, the Bible says. He will pour out a blessing on you that you are not able to contain. Now, I've never yet seen anyone uh, who had faithfully tithed that was really not blessed by God. I have had people to tell me, well, the young, I don't believe in just giving 10%. I don't believe in tithing, but I give way more than 10%. I've had several people that I've asked that told me that. And when I looked at the records, I found out that if, if, they, if their giving represented their tithing, they really wasn't making enough to live by. And I wondered how they could get by. Uh, I just believe with all of my heart that God keeps good records. And He knows what we are doing in terms of giving. And uh, I, I have found out a long time ago, when you get changing with God, God will get changing with you. Now you may not know what changing is, but if you're a southern, that means that God will squeeze you. Uh, so yes, the Bible does teach time. Let's go. One of my favorite scriptures when it comes to tithing, uh, I'll read to you, but I, I don't like the first scripture because it says, you are cursed with a curse. And then it says, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. So I don't know about you, I want to stay away from being cursed and I don't want to rob God. So how does somebody rob God? The next verse as you know, says, bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse. I'll stop right there and I'll, and I'll just add something. Uh, pastored an individual that came to me and said, I'm, I'm gonna start using new cover. He said, I'm gonna give my tithes. And I said, okay. He says, so the way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna go out and buy a bunch of Bibles and then I'm gonna send them off to the country that I'm from. And then he said to family members, what happened? Now, buying Bibles and sending them to people is not wrong. That's a good thing. But the Bible says, not me, but the Bible says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. So the question is, is did that man give his tithe or not? Biblically, the answer is no. He didn't bring his tithe into the storehouse. He used what was supposed to be his tithe or God's time, he used it for something else. So that's just a little add-on that I needed to throw in there. The Bible says this, uh, it continues, it says, that there may be meat in mine house. And he says, prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. So God is saying, prove me, challenge me. I'm, I'm making you this covenant making you this challenge with regards to tithe. He said, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour, out, pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I want that kind of blessing, how about you? Bishop said that we don't do it to get blessed, but this is a law, it's a law in God's word. He does not change, his word does not change. So if you are faithful in tithe, Guess what? There's promises coming back to you. Notice what it says in the next verse. It says, And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your grounds, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. I have pastored people that, and even, even today, that they are living cursed. They want a breakthrough. I was in the office trying to counsel somebody knowing full well there's a situation that needs to be taken care of. 
good person just wants to do right, but there is one thing hindering time. You can't get a breakthrough in your spiritual walk with God if you're not tithing. Why? Because then God will not rebuke the devourer. When, when you're facing circumstances where things are just being taken away, whatever the case is, one of the first things you need to do is check yourself. Are you tithing faithfully? Always inspect yourself. What's going on? Am I doing what's right? Is everything going on? And, and unfortunately, as I said, uh, I've pastored people that, though they're good people, this is the one thing that they're not doing, so therefore they're always struggling. They're, they're living under a curse. I don't want to live under a curse. How about you? Notice this next verse, Luke 18 and 12, if you want to mark it. If you want to go there real quickly, Luke 18 and 12. It simply says, I give tithes of all. Everybody say all. I give tithes of all that I possess. That's pretty open, pretty plain and simple. God wants to bless you. And one of the ways he does it is when he finds you being faithful in tithing. And of course, there is the addition there, and in offering. So, Bishop Young or Pastor? I'll do this quickly. We have one more question after this, but I do want to uh, clarify uh, something because there is, Sometimes there's the idea that I pay tithe, why am I still struggling? And it may be because you haven't paid all the tithe. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna help you. So it is scriptural, Leviticus 27, 30 through 33. Uh, it's, so, it's so scriptural that God says, if you don't pay tithe, I'm gonna charge interest. 5%, it's in your Bible, we'll look at uh, Leviticus 27, if you don't pay your tithe, uh, he charges interest. And somebody said, Do you, are you saying that if I don't pay my tithe, I'm going to hell? No, I didn't say that. Because here's, here's the reason. You say, well, how can, I had a preacher say, well, how can you not answer that? They would say, you're going to go to hell if you don't pay your tithe. Well, here's the reality. You're going to pay your tithe. One way or another, you pay your tithe. You either pay it willingly or God takes it. God always gets his tithe. So you're, he's going to get it one way or another from you. Okay? Some of you are going, oh me, I don't know about that. Tithe is not, as my dad said, a free will offering. It is holy, as the Bible says. It is unto the Lord. In the Old Testament, there were three tithes. There was there were, they were given two times every year, and then every third year there was a third tithe that actually equaled, so you think you've got it tough now, at like 10%, in the Old Testament, it equaled to be 23% with those three tithes, okay? So, Proverbs 11, uh, I'm not gonna take the time, but I would say, instead of looking, this is what bothers me about the modern church. Instead of looking for ways to get out of something are looking for ways to get around things. Why don't we look for ways to be blessed? That's, my, that's one of my biggest problems with the, the new generation. Ever, they want to question everything. Do I have to? Do I have, why don't we change that question? Well, what would bring me closer to blessing? Okay. Let's go to Malachi chapter 6. I want to give you the context of the scripture he just read quickly. Uh, he says in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 6, a son, a son honoreth his father and a servant his master. God says, if I be a father, then where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Said the Lord of hosts, O priest, that despise my name. And you say, wherein have we despised your name? He said, you offered polluted bread upon my altar. He said, where have we offered polluted bread? So the table of the Lord is contemptible. And he said, if you offer, listen to this, if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee and accept thy person? Get the understanding. That's an Old Testament understanding of tithe. He says, you're telling, you're telling everybody that I'm your God. 
that I'm your master. Where's the love? I don't see any honor toward me. Okay? You're telling everybody that. But then you're offering on my table polluted bread, and you're offering to me lamb sacrifices. They knew that they were supposed to offer spotless lambs, right? Because all that was type of what was going to be offered on Calvary, the perfect lamb. And he said, but you're going into your flock, and you're getting that lame lamb that you couldn't sell anyway. You're keeping the good ones, and you're offering that blind sheep, that one that is supposed to be perfect, and you can't make any money off of it anyway. So that's what you're, you're giving me the leftovers. And he said, you're really not giving me first fruits of the spotless lamb. And then he asked a question. He says, try that with your government. Let me put it in American language. You say you'll pay your tithes. Match the way you figure your tithe figure your income and then offer that to the IRS. Would that pass the IRS test? That's the word of God. That's what he says. If what you're saying you really earn, okay, so let me break that down for you. Say, well, Brother Young, I do pay tithes. Okay, let's find out if you do or not. Okay? Brother Young, you're being blunt. Hey, I, this is the Word of God. I'm going to give you the Word of God. Okay, so let's act like you make, let's just, I'm not good with math, so I'm just going to figure on easy numbers. Let's say everybody in here made $100,000 a year. Would that be cool? How many have enjoyed that? Okay, so let's say your salary is $100,000 a year and state and federal taxes is works out to be about 33%, which means... Uh, let's just take easy numbers. So uh, you now have 70% of your income. In your mind, here's what we do. Okay, I make $70,000. So your car payment, you bought a nice car because you, you got a good paycheck coming up. So your car note's $1,000, that's $12,000 a year. Your gas is $200, that's $2,000 a year. Your insurance is $100 a month, that's $1,000 uh, a year. Your, your food budget is three hundred. That's thirty-six hundred dollars a year. So your expenses are nineteen thousand two hundred dollars. So after taxes and after your expenses, that works out to be fifty thousand dollars, fifty thousand eight hundred dollars. But then you got some credit cards, so that's a thousand dollars. You got a house payment of twenty-five hundred. Uh, uh, house insurance three hundred. Clothes one hundred. That's forty-six thousand dollars. So fifty thousand minus forty-six thousand. That gives you four thousand dollars. So my tithe is $400 a year. Do you know that people actually do what I just did? And they say, well, I thought I was supposed to give them my increase. I haven't increased. I had to pay $30,000 worth of taxes. I had to pay $46,000 of bills. Folks, you don't pay on what's left over. He said, try that with the IRS. You don't go fill out your taxes after you figured out what your health club bill was. You don't pay the IRS after all that extra stuff. You say, well, taxes? Yeah, you get stuff for your taxes. It's called roads. It's called police. It's called schools. That's all part of your increase. Okay? I'm in the Bible. This is Bible language. He says... You can't, you can't serve your government better than you serve me, God said. And so this is the reason people, it's, it's good people that don't understand what God is saying. And they live continually, month to month, trying to survive. They're always one paycheck away from being cursed because they're not giving God the first fruits. And so this is a very, very real scripture that I think you need to give thought to. And you're saying, Brother Young, are, are, are you against me? No, I, I'm trying to tell you that that's how blessing flows. Get in this the right way. And don't, don't, don't be afraid of it. He said, prove me. Well, I don't open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. This last question falls under discipleship. Question. How do we determine the will of God? Brother Dean. The scripture says, Romans 12 and 2, we don't know the scripture for this 
purpose, but it is in there. It says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the first thing I want to say is this. The way you live is very important to you proving what is the will of God, to you finding what is the will of God. Holiness is very, very important. That, that allows you, if, if you want to receive it this way, it allows you access to know what the will of God is for your life. Now, God also gave us the gift of, the Bible says the, gift, the gifts to the church in Ephesians 4, one of which is our pastor. From the Old Testament to the New, God always chose a man through which he would mediate his will to the people. If you want to look at, for instance, Moses and the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments were not given to the people, they were given to Moses first. Then Moses took the Ten Commandments to the people. Go back further, same thing in the Garden of Eden. You have God speaking to Adam, to the man. Notice Eve was not present there. God told Adam, said, the day you eat of this tree, you won't die. But he said, so don't eat of it. Adam takes the message to his wife, the woman, to Eve, and says, we're not going to eat of it. Not, don't even touch it. Well, where did the don't touch it come from? It was his way of making sure that he was protecting the woman that he loved. So he, if you want to put it this way, this is the first standard of the Bible. Adam added that because he wanted to make sure that he protected. Now, the reason I mention that is because as, as pastors, leaders, we don't try to Force, we don't try to force people to do anything. Uh, as a pastor of La Roca, I, I don't do anything by force. My job is to preach what the Bible says. And the job of the church is to follow what has been preached. It has nothing to do with forcing. It's just the way God has designed for His will to be shared to the people. So the way I look at it in my personal life, this is, this is the way I figure it out for me. Number one, I make sure that I'm living right with God. Holiness, everything else that's involved. Make sure that I'm living right, that I'm right. If I'm looking for the will of God, I've got to make sure my heart's right. I don't, I don't need it to be cluttered or what have you. And if it's cluttered, I work on me. I let the Holy Ghost work on me. Then, if I still don't have clear direction, or maybe there's a couple of options, I've done this within the past year when it comes to using my elders for counsel. I have three elders in my life, Bishop Wilson, Bishop Young, and my pastor. Maybe it's just, I'm that difficult to pastor, so you need three of them. <laughs> I see it as a blessing. So I've gone to them and I've asked them, I've got the situation. This is what I feel. This is, what do you think? Give me some advice. And guess what? They have given me advice. In a multitude of counselors, the Bible says, there's safety there. So they are, they're not trying to force me and tell me what to do exactly, whatever the case is. But guess what? If any of them three tell me, do this, it doesn't matter if I agree with it or not. I'm going to obey because I'm going to submit myself to the authority that God has given us. And this is completely biblical. I cannot go wrong finding the will of God for my life if I am in complete submission to the man of God. Amen. And See, when you obey the Bible, God just blesses you. In the Old Testament, real quickly, Moses, 
was asked to choose leaders out of the congregation because he needed assistance for, for ministry. He was wearing himself out, he was wearing the people out. It was just one man with hundreds of thousands, millions of people. So therefore, gets these men, leaders among the tribes, brings them in. These are the men that are gonna help him. What does God do? If you remember the story, God says, I, Moses, I'm gonna take of that spirit that is upon you, the anointing that is upon you, and I'm gonna put it on these men that have been faithful and that are faithful to you. I would be dumb to try to break that pattern. I want to be under the authority that God has put over, put over me because it's not it, the will of God. It's very, very broad in some cases and sometimes finding it. I'm just going to be honest with you and let you know, I'm going to need some help finding the will of God. And I thank God I've got leadership that will help me. Behind Badger skin. 
And uh, here I live in a fine place. And so he called Nathan, his, one of his counselors, prophet of God, and he told Nathan what he proposed to do, and that was to build the house of God. Nathan responded immediately by saying, Do what is in your heart, and God is with you. But the Bible says that that night, God spoke to Nathan, and he said, You go back to David, and you tell him that he cannot build my house. And Nathan did that. It was quite a thing for him to come and reverse what he had said. But uh, I, I am so inspired by David's response when Nathan came to him and said, you can't do what you want to do. David, in his prayer to God and giving thanks, he said, I have heard your word. In other words, David was saying, I heard Nathan speak. But it was not just a man speaking. It was the voice of God. God was speaking with me through Nathan the prophet. So not only do we need to put ourselves and our life in the hands of God, but we need to seek out godly counsel. And we need to receive that counsel as a voice from God. Now throughout my experience, I have pr tried to practice uh, the effort to find the open door and uh, walk through that open door. But here's what I have discovered. And I, I will say this in the Holy Ghost. Every door that's open to you is not necessarily the will of God. The devil can open doors. And that's the reason you need godly counsel. I had a young man come to me one time. He was having issues at home. He was having issues at work. And he had some friends that lived in the distant state. And he said, uh, and he poured out his heart to me and he said, Brother Young, I feel like I've just got to move. I've got to leave. And uh, uh, I, I'm not the kind of person that wants to clench on the people and hold them. I have discovered through experience that the best way to hold people is to turn them loose. So I was not going to pressure him to stay. Uh, but I didn't feel comfortable about it. And I warned him. I told him, before you proceed to do that, spend some time in prayer and uh, come back and let's talk again. He came back and he really didn't have time to pray long about it, but he said, Brother Young, I'm going. So he left. Basically, he was leaving without asking, but he was leaving by telling me. He was there probably a month and I got a call late one night and uh, he was weeping on the other end of the phone. He said, uh, he said, Brother Young, things have not worked and have worked out. And he said, I am absolutely broke. I don't have anything. I don't have a place to live. And he said, I've got to come back home. He said, is there any way that you could help me? And I said, absolutely. And I managed to get the money to him for him to come back home. He was home. Uh, I don't remember how long. It was not much over a month until I heard from his folks that he had left again. And he was gone completely. And it was quite a long time before I heard him again. He, he was spending his time running. I just want to tell you, you can't, you can't walk through every door that opens because the devil opens some doors. You need to depend on godly, wise counsel before you make a move in life. The best way to find the will of God for your life is to be sincere and seek out that counsel. God bless you. So I'll close up tonight's session and uh, by tagging on, I'm going to I'm going to make my remarks based off of the same passage that that brother Diaz referred to. And those of you that have been around uh, Pentecost a long time, especially our elderly, what you're hearing tonight is not new. This is the truth. These are the traditions. These are the principles 
that were taught in the apostolic truth from the very beginning. And uh, I'm a person that loves tradition. I love, I'm, I'm romantic in the sense I love, I love those old connections. I am wearing my family on my mother's side. This is the Davidson uh, Tartar from, uh, no, Tartan, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm hungry, I'm saying Tartan. The Tartan, I'm sorry, my brain's fried. Uh, the Tartan, my mom's family, the side of her family, is from Scotland, and this is the Davidson family Tartan. And in Scotland, there's the Tullock Castle that our family's from. So I wore it tonight because I wanted to, I want to remember my family roots, and I want to remember our family roots in this book. And knowing the will of God, uh, I appreciate what I've just heard. But let's be honest. Not every decision that you have to make, can you talk to me or talk to him or talk to him. There's decisions in life that sometimes you have to make all by yourself. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And sometimes we're saying, God, how can I know the will of God? Nobody understands what I'm going through. No, nobody sees this. And, and I, I, I talk to pastor and, I, God, what is it going to be? And so let me help you with this one scripture. It's the same scripture Brother uh, Gerard has said. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove. Everybody say that you may prove. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? I want to break that down. That word prove is in the Greek, dokimazo, which literally means, listen to this, this is good, means to distinguish a proof after testing. Don't miss that. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may be able to prove or to distinguish by testing. Maybe you've never seen this before. What is good, what is acceptable, what is perfect. God's not going to quit being your God because you don't choose the exact right thing. I want to help you here. He gives you distinct distinctions. There's good, there's acceptable, and then there's perfect. Now, we know there's some that it's not the will of God. Let's be honest. We know what those are. We pretty much know. <laughs> I know that ain't the will of God because that's a sin, that's compromise, it's going to take me away from church. It's gonna, we, that, he doesn't address that because as a child of God, you should have spiritual discernment to say, I know that ain't right. That's not our problem. If that's our problem, why are you even praying about it? You're, you're, you're a backslid anyway. If you can't figure out what's right or wrong, I'm not talking about right or wrong, I'm talking about finding the will of God. There's good, there's acceptable, there's the perfect will of God. So the way you do that is don't conform to the world. So what that tells me is, okay, how am I thinking? I'm looking for the will of God. How am I thinking? I'm thinking like everybody at work right now. I'm thinking like everybody at school right now. I'm thinking like everybody in the world around me. Okay, I, I can't think that way because I'm trying to find perfect will of God. Yeah, from a logical stance, it may make sense for me to sell the house, move, because I can get a lot more property in Tucum Carrier, New Mexico than I can. So logically, let's think like the American dream. I want a house, a dog, a picket fence, a boat. I want to be able to take three vacations a year. I can't do that because it costs too much. Is that wrong? Is that a sin? No. But that might not be the perfect will of God. Because you as a parent may be supposed to go through something so that your child 10 years later gets connected with the will of God for something really important for the kingdom, but because you followed a good thing that God's not going to judge you for, but you missed the perfect will of God. So what I'm telling you is, ask yourself, how am I thinking right now? Am I thinking like the world? 
Am I basing my decisions off of a financial decision? Am I basing my decisions off of what I want to do and some dream that I developed when I was 15 and read a Hardy Boy book and I want a house like that on the East Coast? I'm using an example here of what we do. The reality is we cannot allow our mind, because we're not like everybody else. We're the people of God. We're serving the Missio Day. He's not working for us. God, I want a big house in the Hamptons. I mean, who doesn't? But that may not be the perfect will of God. It doesn't mean if you go do it, you're going to hell in the back seat. There's good, there's acceptable, but there's perfect will of God. What is the perfect will of God? He says, don't be conformed. That means shape. Don't allow you as a Christian, because you're not like everybody else, don't become cookie cutter. Don't allow them press to press the worldly image on what life is supposed to be about the house, the car, the picket fence, the, the amount of the bank account, the 401k. That's what the world, they're living for all of that. He says, don't be conformed to that. Think differently. God may do something radically different with you and your family. Seek first the kingdom of God. Don't let the world shape you. But the word is literally to be transformed is literally but be meta, metamorphos. Like metamorphosis, like caterpillar to the butterfly, tadpole to the frog, that's metamorphosis. He said, don't be conformed to the world, but let the spirit, that renewing of your mind, get in the presence of God and let, that's what it means, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Get back to the will of God. Okay, God. I'm not looking for good. I'm not looking for acceptable. I don't want to just get through. What is the perfect will of God? I want the mind of Christ. That can only come through the renewing of your mind. So, in those moments where you... Because I'm just going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you not to. I'm not going to lie to you. Tell you you're going to be under a curse. You're not going to be under a curse. Now, some of y'all going to pick up and leave tomorrow. I don't do that. I don't play those preacher games. Well, bless God, you leave the church, you're going to die in a car. That's a bunch of baloney. I don't believe that. Sorry, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't play that game. I'm not going to tell you something that, you, that and act like it's God when it's not. Because you don't have to be in this church to be saved. You don't have to be in this church to go to heaven. But I will tell you, you can get out of the perfect will of God. And I would say to seek Diligently, not your will, but his will. Don't judge the will of God by bank account, job opportunity, cool cars, and a better retirement plan. What is God doing with you? And so that's the way I try to live my life, that it's proven to be faithful. I had a situation in my life, and I'm close with this, where I was at a time of, of decision, and uh, I had, uh, we were pastoring a little church, running on a good Sunday, 50 people. And I was working full time, uh, a job, my wife was working. We had struggled through, we were living in a Sunday school class. And I could tell that something was happening in my life, that, that there was a change. And that God was calling us to do something different. And it had been, it had been difficult, it had been hard, but as I look back over my life, the happiest moments of my life were in those moments, my wife and I talked about it. Because it was just pretty simple. It was just pretty, get up, go to work, go have church, teach Bible study, come back, do the kids, and, do, and it was just simple. It, it, it wasn't a lot of problems. It, it, the, the biggest problem was we didn't have any money. But it, you know, when you don't have money, you don't have any bills because you can't pay up anyway. So it was, it was, it was, that was life. But I can tell that God was doing something different. And wouldn't you know it, opportunity appeared. And sometimes, this is where I think we are with this question, is that opportunity never seems to be only one thing. It's always like options. Has anybody discussed me ever noticed that? It's like, if it was right and wrong, you would know what the right is. Oh, that's right, I'll do that. But... We know what the wrong is. The wrong is not the problem. It's that, okay, I got three options here, what I do. And so I was, it was pretty significant opportunities to take some churches that people had asked me to come take. 
and it was going to be radically financially different. It would have put me in the game, so to speak, of leadership and recognition. And, and for a, a 30 year old guy at that time, it was like, okay, this is easy street. Let's step in, let's do it. I mean, let's. And so that was pulling. And one day I sat with my dad, counsel, and I had just about decided I'm going to do such and such. This church opportunity is there, and uh, I, could, I could be in the game right there. And it felt good, and it would have been good. I mean, honestly, it could have been good. It could have even been acceptable. Because it was a good church, and it was good people. And I remember sitting down at the table at my dad's house in Baton Rouge, sitting at the kitchen dinette set, and he looked at me and he said, Miles, you've got such and such options. He said, but really, don't think about right now. He said, go down the road a little ways in your mind. What's your heart saying about there? What's your heart saying about your kids? Versus what you're about to do, how does that affect your kids? Versus, and he named the other thing, which was to come to Sacramento. And the other place I would have been, the big kahuna, I'd have been the pastor at 30 with a pretty big paycheck. A lot more than I came back to be Brother Wilson's helper. And, oh, you're working with Brother Wilson for 10 years everywhere I went. Oh, this is Brother Wilson's assistant pastor. I got an ego too. But I understood there was a perfect will of God. And I look back over my life at where I am now, of the blessing of God that has been in my life and has unfolded Amen. through the perfect will. I could have followed good will. I could have, good would that be a good business? I could have followed acceptable will. But in my life, I felt like my wife's night of prayer, fasting, and counsel. We made a decision not based off right now what was easier. We made a decision after prayer. What did it really look like tomorrow? Circumspectly. Let's look down the road. And we made what I believe was the right decision. So I hope these things tonight have helped you and been a strength to you. And uh, we're going to be doing this on a monthly basis. And uh, I think Brother Diaz did an outstanding job. So I love you. It's going to be a good week. I know a lot of you are working and practicing and all of that. I applaud you, thank you, and salute you. Let's come back here Sunday morning, and let's have a wonderful time. God bless all of you.